In this episode of Conducting Pills, we'll dive into the delicate and sensual music of the prelude to Peleas and Melisande by Gabriel Fauré. Hi, I'm Jamari Grillo, I'm a conductor and a composer, and welcome to this episode of Conducting Pills, a series where we'll look into a classical piece or a part of it and outline its structure and phrasing, orchestration and harmony, with the bonus technical tips for conductors. I want to take a second to remind you that on my website you can find more than 70 videos now between score and technical analysis, the full episodes of Conducting Pills, on top of the live sessions and plenty of other material. Now, let's begin! The symbolist play Peleas et Melisan, written by Maurice Metterlink, uh, never had much success on stage. The tragic story of the title characters, entangled in an impossible love triangle that reminds of Paolo and Francesca, was derided by critics at its premiere in 1893. It did, however, get the admiration of many artists, from Strindberg to Rilke, from Sibelius to Debussy, who wrote an entire opera on it, to Gabriel Fauré. The prelude is based on two themes. The first one opens the prelude played only by the strings minus double basses. A conflict in G major quickly turns into a mysterious E minor. According to critic Gerard Lartney, this theme reflects Melisande's introverted personality. Notice the pizzicato of the double basses and the longer slurs the second time the opening theme is repeated to underline the pianissimo dynamic. The music takes a leap forward with three bars progression using the same material and adding the flutes in thirds. The flutes playing in the middle of register are beautifully coloring the sound of the strings. But the phrase quickly falls back on itself, dissipating the tension and hinting at a return to the G major. Notice the one note of the horn. This, like the flute's two bars earlier, are little details enriching the orchestration in a very refined way, something that Debussy and Ravel will take to a whole new level in the years to come. Another progression starts and rises for four bars, starting at rehearsal number two. and inevitably falls back. See how this piece is constructed on continuous emotional waves, moving forward and pulling backward in a constant game of dynamics contrasts. Another four bars progression drives to the first fortissimo, retreating to a piano after one bar, and then fortissimo again. Notice the gentleness added by the harp, the beauty of the bass line moving downward while the other line moves up and the entrance of a single trumpet, again in the low register, to color the sound without disturbing the atmosphere. After the first fortissimo, the main theme interjects through the oboe. The second fortissimo is much more dramatic. But the flutes dampen it out, helped by the change in harmony. It's another peculiarity of this piece, the constant harmonic shifts. The opening material is used to bridge to a second theme, introduced by a romantic solo cello with woodwind, with an ominous symphony part in pianissimo. Notice the beautiful horn line on bar 36 and the game of darkness and light that this line goes through. Bar 39 breathes anxiously into the phrase. Once more, the line falls back and restarts with a new progression, reaching another fortissimo. A couple of bars later, the music falls down to rest, but not just yet. But it retakes the motive we heard at rehearsal number two, interjecting the main theme and builds on it once more. We arrive at the real climax of this prelude, with the powerful allargando stretching the sentiment of the characters.
and then again back to almost nothing. A chord of the string sustaining the one pitch line of the horn. This line may suggest Golod's discovery of Melisand in the forest. One last emotional wave and the piece closes, circling back to the very opening. Notice though the F natural hinting once more towards a change of harmony in the third to last bar. It does not last and we can finally rest on our comforting G major. One of the most difficult things to control is the breath of the piece. This music needs small unwritten push and pull here and there in order to come alive. You need to breathe with the music constantly and control the speed of your baton, spacing it evenly between one pulse and another. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button below the video and ring the bell so you will get notified every time a new video comes out. For more in-depth analysis, conducting technique and conducting exercises, look on my website and follow my Facebook group. All the links are in the description. Let me know in the comments what you think about this piece and if you have any suggestions for future videos. And I look forward to seeing you next week with a new episode of Conducting Pills when we will go through Karlovich's strength discernment. In the meanwhile, please continue to enjoy music and be well. Ciao! Push and pull nuances are such that if you don't breathe through it, they are simply not going to happen and this music will die. So, what's the technical key to this? Well, simply put,